morning, City Church. Good morning. Wow, this is great. Yes. Well, I'm going to uh, I'm going to welcome everyone this morning and, and go through a few things, a few announcements, and then uh, some scripture that um, that I ran head on into this morning that I think is going to um, it's applicable for today and is going to set the tone for uh, for what we desire here this morning. So a couple of things. Uh, if you're joining us for the very first time, um, we have usually, in a typical non-COVID service months ago, we would weave this into kind of about the middle of our service, and that would be um, uh, welcoming visitors. And we would normally be shaking hands and doing all of that. So, But we don't want to miss those that are coming for the first time and get you some information about what City Church is and have a way to contact you. So not to embarrass anyone, but if you're here for the first time, would you raise your hand ever so slightly? Okay, so I have a couple of teen and one non-teen, a young adult, who are going to, uh, who are going to make their way over. So I know I saw, I saw this hand. Anyone back there? A couple more. So as they continue to do that, I'm going to, um, I also want to welcome those that are watching this morning, those that are online. If you're at home on your couch, you have about four minutes to get ready to get up off your couch and worship with the rest of us. So be prepared, because I can tell you that there is a spirit of, um, of rejoicing this morning. I know that the worship team, as we were here a few hours ago and um, getting to join together, not with a different heart, but just with a different type of instrument. It's different outside. It's different. Um, we're, we grow used to and accustomed to what we do musically, and um, but yet it doesn't change our hearts. And so we want this morning to, to fill this place with praise, you know, through the doors, through the windows that it, that it echoes out of here. And so uh, we look forward to that. So if you're at home this morning, prepare yourself, set your coffee down, and be, be ready. So Thanksgiving's coming up, and if you don't know, our, our church has partnered with um, with a school locally, Pace Academy, and um, this school is a, it's an incredible resource for kids that have very little at home, very little in the way of family structure and very little in the way of resources. So we had the wonderful blessing as a body last year to come alongside this school both at Thanksgiving and at Christmas. And so as we come into this Thanksgiving season, we are um, definitely signed up to do that again. So if you're at home this morning, if you're not here with us, um, you're not going to be able to pick up one of these, but you are invited to call the church anytime during the week, get the information and get your name on the list. So if you are here or those that are here this morning, think about it. Don't think about it very long. Just commit to doing it. It's not very difficult. Make sure that you, you uh, uh, go by the hub on your way out. Sign your name up so we know who's, uh, who's committed to doing it. You have until the 18th of November to get, uh, to get the items purchased and, and delivered and here at the church. And the church will take care of putting it all together and taking it over to the kids. So how many meals, how many complete family meals did we have last year? We can do that, 52 meals. Yeah, so it was a great blessing, and um, I think it's a privilege for us to be able to do that. So, okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some scripture this morning that um, as soon as I opened to where I, um, where I knew I would be reading my devotion this morning, um, these scriptures just jumped out to me. So given, um, given where we are as a country, given where we are as a community, given where we are going in the next few days, um, I, I want you to pay close attention to the scripture. It's Colossians 1, starting in verse 16. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. That includes governments. That includes countries, that includes world powers, that includes all of us. And verse 17, and he is before all things, and in him all things exist. I think it's important that we continue to recognize who's in control and who's on the throne. 
couple minutes before I came up here, I was just having this conversation with Richard, and um, I told him he needed to get up here and preach it because he was, uh, he was very much echoing what this scripture says, that all things are before him and all things are made by him. We don't need to fear where we are, where we are and where we are going. Amen? Would you guys stand with me? going to read one more verse from the same from the same chapter and this is verse 11 so this is a few verses before those i just read verse 11 says strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy we are not called to suffer fear or anxiety or worry we are called to suffer joy long suffering joy that we live that each and every day so let's Let's bow our heads, let's pray, let's join our hearts together as we, um, as we call upon the name of the Lord um, and we give him the praise that he is due. Father God, we thank you, Jesus, for your scripture and, and for the way in which that your Holy Spirit speaks uh, through these words, Lord God, these words that continue to, um, to direct us and continue to center us, Lord Jesus, on the place that you would have us to be today and tomorrow and in the days ahead. Lord, may we each be long-suffering, joyful people, Lord God, desiring not to look um, at the situation that we are currently in, Lord God. But Jesus, recognize where you have brought us to, recognize the places where your hand has been, that in those moments we may not have seen it, God. You have been there. You are always there. And we welcome you this morning, Lord Jesus, into this place. We welcome you into our hearts. God, we... We are so blessed to be able to be here this morning. We're so blessed to be able to enter into worship. I pray protection. I pray keeping over all of us and those that are at home this morning. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.
just are so grateful for everything that you have chosen to bestow on us, for the friendships we have, for the family we have, for the church we have. God, I just am so grateful. Lord, we love you. We worship you. May the message just be a continued part of worship, God, that you would be lifted high, that you would be magnified. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name. Wear a flannel, they said. <laughs> It'll be fun, they said. <laughs> Who said that to me? I don't know. Nobody, really. <laughs> it just seemed like a good idea. <laughs> good morning, City Church. Oh, it's so good to see all of you here this morning. Good to be able to worship inside the house of the Lord. I know that church isn't a building. Church is, you know, a collection of people. But God sure did give us a nice building, and it's nice to be inside of it, right? So, um, yeah, it's good to see you all this morning. Uh, real quickly... For you who are here today, we still haven't started doing ushers yet or anything like that. So um, if you're wanting to give your tithes an offering after service, you can stop by the hub back there and, um, and drop it in back there. If you're new with us today, there is a um, little connection card in that red bag you were given. And um, just some information so that we can begin to flood your email box with spam and you know, solicit money constantly and do all of those. No, it'll be none of that. But we would like to be able to stay in touch with you. And you probably will start getting like a weekly email from me that just tells you what to expect at City Church. And those are handy right now since things have been so fluid the last, you know, seven, eight months. It's nice to kind of know what to expect each week and what's on the horizon for us. So we like to be able to stay in touch with you. So if you fill out that connection card, turn it in after service, we have a gift for you back there to choose from and just a way to say that we are so grateful you're here with us today. God is good to us, amen? Amen. You heard, um, you heard Todd talking before service about our chance to provide each family at Pace Academy with a um, Thanksgiving dinner. So I'll just add to that, it's just this little grocery list of like an easy to prepare Thanksgiving dinner. And I know the tendency sometimes is to want to go overboard when you're doing something generous, like get a huge turkey. Or, but keep in mind that not all of these families have the, the means to cook something like that. So we tend to make a list of things that are easier to prepare. And really a whole meal costs less than $20 the way we have it set up. So it's not a it's not a huge financial commitment to be able to do this for a family, but it means the world to these kids when you see them get to take a whole Thanksgiving dinner home to their family before the holidays. So it's just a huge deal. And then again at Christmas time when we do kind of our adopt a kid program, you know, well, each kid fills out a little Christmas list and then we hang it up there and you grab that and there's like a $25 limit. So Again, it's not a huge commitment for those of you who choose to obey the rules. Some of you don't know the meaning of a $25 limit. I see these kids opening presents at the school last year. It's like, that didn't cost 25 bucks, right? If it did, tell me where you got that, right? Because I want one too. I want one too. David asked if he could see my office this morning, went in there, he's all, I didn't realize you like toys. <laughs> it's the first thing that jumps out to you when you go in there, believe me. So anyways, be sure to support our kids. And for those of you who are watching online, Jeremiah probably already threw it up for you. But if you're wanting to give, I forgot to say that, Jeremiah, we have different ways for you to do that. You can text to give. Um, 
We have a website that has a giving page, so however you want to do that. Okay, well, we are going to be in John chapter 20 this week, and um, I've really been wrestling through this chapter and just even kind of balancing things out with us coming back inside today and, and just what was the Lord saying through all of this. And in that, I, I reached out to my wife yesterday and I said, hey, you want to help me with this chapter? And um, she said, yes. So Tori is going to come and co-teach with me. So for those of you who are new here today or new to the live stream, this lovely lady is my wife, Tori. And she is amazing. Yes, please clap for her. Else I'll get angry. Okay. Yep. We have been married for 23 years. Yes. And um, she really is the most amazing person that I know. I just love her, and she's so wonderful to do ministry with. Sweet. And she has so much wisdom for me to draw on. So I love it that I can just reach out to her, like, literally very short notice and go, hey, you want to do this with me? She's like, yep. Yep, I'm in. So... We're going to take on John chapter 20 together, which is a resurrection chapter. Are you ready to get into the word this morning? All right. Well, I believe you, but I'm still going to pray for you. (laughs) Father, prepare our hearts, Lord, I pray, to receive your word, Lord. I thank you, God, for the opportunity that we've had to bring you worship and praise this morning. You are worthy of it, God. In every circumstance, every situation, Lord, it doesn't matter, God. In the hard times, in the perfect times, Lord, you are worthy, God. So we thank you for this. Guide us in your word today, Lord, I pray. I pray, God, that this message would bring uh, peace and hope and assurance to your children today. In your name, Jesus, we pray this. Amen. So, back in Easter, over six months ago now, I actually taught out of John 20. And um, because, of course, Resurrection Sunday and looking at that. And then, over 19 weeks ago now, because we've had some guest speakers, we started going through the Gospel of John chapter by chapter. The point of it being that when we first started this, it was actually immediately after, um, after George Floyd was killed. And the country wasn't, was in a complete uproar at that time. And there were riots going on and just all kinds of chaos in our nation on top of the fact that we were still in this COVID lockdown and everything else. And it was an incredibly just um, turbulent, kind of scary time. And what we started focusing on, what the Holy Spirit led me to during that time going through John, is that Jesus is still the answer. He was the answer to everything. He's, he's the answer to racism. He is the answer to healing. He is the answer. He's everything we need. And just chapter by chapter, we've been going through the Gospel of John looking at how Jesus is the answer for us. and um, But prior to that, in Easter, I had actually taught on John chapter 20. And it was interesting for me to go back. I actually was able to watch the video of it, to go back um, online and watch that service and see what the Lord was kind of laying on my heart at that time in John 20, at that moment, as opposed to what he's laying on my heart for at this time. And I think just looking at that contrast is part of what has really caused me to wrestle through that this chapter this time. And um, if we can, I'd like to go through and just do a couple of recaps on what we looked at at Easter in John chapter 20. Even though I am sure all of you remember perfectly what my sermon was back then, And I'm flattered by that. (laughs) For my benefit, I'm just going to refresh my memory here a little bit. So um, we focused more in 
on the period of time directly after the resurrection of Jesus when the disciples have not seen him yet and they're hiding in fear, okay, in a house. And it says in John chapter 20, verse 19, hey, Jackie, is that your water right there? Can you bring it to me? I need a little bit of water. All that worshiping and playing in a flannel <laughs> takes its toll. I don't know if that'll be. I'll set it right here in front of the camera. Then. Okay. Anyhow, so um, we're going to pick it up there in verse 19 of John chapter 20. It says, "On the evening." Of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you and after he said that he showed them his hands and his side and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord and again Jesus said peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So we find the disciples at this point, they were locked in their houses because they were afraid of death. And at the time, I kind of pointed out the connection between what they were experiencing and what we were experiencing at that time. And um, because at that moment, when we first went through John chapter 20 on Easter, the whole COVID-19 thing, coronavirus, was very new. And nobody knew exactly what was happening and we were still on shelter in place orders and all of those things were going on and we didn't know how extreme or not extreme or we just really didn't know what to think about the virus at that time and you know here we were pre-recording these services and putting them online for our church but all of us in those moments were pretty much shut up in our houses afraid of what was happening outside and there was a very strong connection but jesus appears to him in that moment as they're afraid they're afraid of the crowd that they had just seen crucify him jesus appears to them in that moment and what is he proving to them they had seen him crucified right they had seen him killed but what he proves to him right in that moment is that he is greater than death that he actually conquered death and i can just imagine you know what a what a shock that was to them what a relief that was to them as they're hiding in there afraid of the people who had killed jesus but jesus stands before him and he says well they couldn't actually get the job done could they right they couldn't keep me in that grave jesus was greater than death and he speaks peace to them and he breathes life to them and he gives them authority of course, we one of them was missing the event, and we'll, we'll catch up with him in just a second, but Jesus was bringing that peace to them in that moment. Is it my part now? That's what okay. you... Yeah. I know. Okay. okay. Um, so I am a little nervous, and I don't know why, because please pray for me. Okay. Just um, don't make any mistakes. I'm just, I know I'm going to, so there's that. It's okay. Um, so this... The saying, peace be to you, I believe was a common greeting that back then that they would say shalom, shalom when they saw somebody or when they departed ways. Um, and I think the first time it's recorded of Jesus saying it is in John 14, 27 through 31. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. 
I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He is no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. So I just know that the world will tell us that we have peace in people, that we have peace and wealth, but Jesus is entering the room and saying peace to them this third time. And I just want you to recognize that this brings power. Jesus' words give them the strength to continue on to the next time when he's going to meet with them again, uh, poured out in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, and his peace and his presence enabled them to write the New Testament for us and the church, the church today. So Christ gave us the Holy Spirit, and his presence is peace. That was it, like five something this morning. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry, I'm going to throw you a little curveball here because I know how much you like that. But I just felt like the Lord was kind of impressing upon me while you were sharing that with us to have you pray for us for peace. Yeah. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we get to come here and to um, build one another up, God, that you designed the church. God, and that we are fitly joined together and that you've called us to do things, Lord God, and you tell us to do it in peace. God, I thank you that um, you bring to this body, each and every one, peace of their mind, Lord God, the peace that surpasses all understanding. God, I thank you for the work that you're doing, and I thank you that, um, that it is ours to attain as we keep walking in our relationship with you, as we keep walking in the things that you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So, if we go down a little bit, like I said, there was one of the disciples at that point, of the 11 remaining disciples, who, who missed that first appearance of Jesus, and that was Thomas. Thomas was not there when this happened, so um, if we pick it up in verse 24, it says, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, saying, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put the fingers and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, notice that. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, I love the little details that scripture gives you. It says, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, again, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands? And he said, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Now, a lot of times we get kind of sidetracked with the fact that Thomas had doubted and he had to see Jesus. But to me, what I focus on more there is the grace and love of Jesus, that Thomas missed the event, and yet Jesus was faithful to come back and show himself to him. And it's not like, it's not so much of a rebuke, right? It's, it's his love for Thomas, and he says, Thomas, this is what you needed. Here's my hands. Check it out. Go ahead. Feel my side, right? It's what he needed to do for Thomas in that moment. So it's not just about Thomas the doubter. It's about Jesus, our gracious and loving Savior, again, doing what he needed to do to bring peace. It makes me think of that, how he says he'll leave the 99 and go after the one, right? It's like, I'm not going to leave Thomas out of this. He missed that first, that first appearance, but I'm coming back. I'm going to get him up to speed. I'm going to go bring him. And that's how Jesus feels about each and every one of us. But there's that other little detail there that it's a week later, and they're still in that room with all the doors locked. And that's interesting to me because now they've had the appearance of Jesus to them already. 
and they've seen that Jesus is greater than death and Jesus can conquer death and that, you know, the people who they're afraid of couldn't hold him down. And he's even given them authority by that point of forgiveness of sins and all these things. He's just invested into them. And yet a week later, and they're still in the exact same place with the doors locked. Right. And that kind of strikes me like, my goodness, what is going on? They've already seen Jesus. They know, right? They know. But what's interesting is that the Lord, he never rebukes them for that. He never, um, he never says, what are you still doing in here with the doors locked, right? And in fact, there might have been a certain amount of wisdom to what they were doing in that moment. The dangers outside were still real. And even their best barricades against the world, it wasn't able to keep Jesus out of their midst. So, you know, what's the matter? So Jesus came into the room. And at the time, I remember back in, um, back in Easter, kind of drawing a correlation between us. But Tori, what did you want to say about Thomas there? Um, I wanted to say that, so when Thomas was doubting, Jesus didn't fault him for it. And I think it was showing... Thomas's own walk with the Lord, and it shows our, how our personal walk could be with the Lord too, that we have to go through um, ourselves like learning to walk, learning to believe, and remembering how faithful God has been in the past, so we know that he's going to do what he, what he did in the past, he'll do it again. We can always trust in that. Um, there will come a point in each of our lives where we have to stop doubting and believe though, and we have the benefit on this side of things, whereas Thomas was right in the at the middle, the birth of the church. And the disciples, they receive power to live out what they were called to do. And we have that same call to live out what the words that they wrote. We have, we have to know the word. Um, we have to know that, we have to know the word when life is crazy around us. And we have to stay tethered and anchored to the word and God's promises. And I think it's a typo there. And his love and his presence. So, yeah, so six months ago, I think about the situation that we were in at a church, as a church, and it's weird because I'm telling you, it almost feels like it was years ago, <laughs> not six months ago. It's, it's really hard for me to get my head around it because we were in such a different place at that moment. We didn't know what was happening course, none of us had gone through anything like that, the shelter in place orders. And I remember getting in my truck and driving through empty streets to come down here to the church, right, to keep regular office hours and not knowing if we were going to get in trouble for like being out of our homes and being at the church because of, you know, and it's like, well, I need to go down there and get stuff done. And we had to have access to the computer and the media things. And so we just did it, but it was such a such an unsettling time during that moment. And just really looking back on it, it, it almost feels just unreal to me for some reason. We were we were recording all of these, you know, things on cell phones. You know, we didn't even have cameras or anything back then, so we'd set up our cell phones and record different elements. We'd record the worship. You know, we had worship going eventually, not at that point, but we had worship going with like multiple camera angles that would switch from this and that. That was just cell phones set up around here in the sanctuary. And then we cut it all together on iMovie and drop GarageBand over it. We were literally, when I say we, that was pretty much me and sometimes my son at this point. We were video editing 20 plus hours a week during that time, sometimes 25 hours sitting at that Mac, almost in that exact spot, just video editing. And that was church. And then we get these things uploaded by Thursday to be a live, you know, release so we could start promoting it. And it was just a crazy time. But during that time, coming up on Easter, I was looking for a scriptural precedent on what we were going through. And God just showed that to me in, in John chapter 20, that here were the disciples having full confidence that Jesus had risen. 
They had seen him, and yet they were still locked in their homes, and Jesus didn't rebuke them, right? And it was a great comfort to me in what we were going through at that time that even though we weren't coming to church to gather together and we were all a little bit afraid of what was going on outside and the disease and everything else, that Jesus was not rebuking us for it. He was not, you know, he was still with us and comforting us and speaking peace to us. But here's where it got crazy for me because then I see this week, which is our very first Sunday back in our building, right? Right? Here we are back together corporately again, and I am, believe me, I am not smart enough or disciplined or organized enough to, to, to schedule this. We land right on John chapter 20 again, which is the very chapter that I talked about on Easter as we were all sheltering in place. And now here we are at John 20 again on the first Sunday when we're all back together. I was like, oh my goodness, okay. God, are you saying something in this? Because I don't believe it's an accident. I believe that the Lord was coordinating something. And that's when just all week I've been wrestling through, so God, what are you saying to the church that we have come back to the same place? And this first thing I want to say to you especially if you're still watching at home, especially if you're still sheltering in place or doing anything like that. I want to say this with all the grace and like not, not being critical, like with all the compassion in the world. But here's what I do believe the Lord is saying to us today is that they didn't stay locked in that room forever. That is not where their story ended. In fact, if we look at the book of Acts then in chapter 3, we see an actual transformation that has taken place in the disciples. Now, full disclosure, what happened in Acts chapter 2 is pretty important to this story. Because in Acts chapter 2, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus told him in that time, he said, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power, right, to be witnesses. But we do see the disciples acting differently in Acts chapter 3, because now they're preaching and they're they're going to the, to the temple again to worship, and, and they pass by and they heal this lame man. And in Acts chapter 3, verse 12, it says, When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, remember they just healed the lame man. He says, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? And why do you stare at us if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. And you handed him over to be killed. And you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One. I want you to understand the the severity of what Peter is saying to these religious leaders at the time. The very people that they were all hiding in fear from, the very people they were all locked in their house, right? And they wouldn't come out, and Jesus is appearing to them in in these locked rooms. Peter is now talking to these people, and he said, you killed the Messiah. He just point blank, you're the ones who did it. You disowned him. And even Pilate wanted to let him go. You wouldn't have it. It's on your head that you killed your own Savior, your own Messiah. It's very bold. It's very severe what Peter is saying to him. And it says, you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see now and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him 
as you can all see. So what we know is that at some point, the resurrection power of Jesus involves us facing down death. And at some point, and Peter even cites it when he says, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. At some point, there comes a point where they had to leave the house, right? And put their faith and their confidence in the Lord. Now, here's where I'm not wanting this to be critical in any way. I don't define that for you. And I would not even tell you when it is or isn't time for you to step back into more of life or what what your path of progression is going to be on that or when you're going to wear a mask when you're not going to wear a mask that i'm not qualified to make that decision for you but what i would ask you to think about is who is making that decision for you who is telling you when it's ready to go because Unfortunately, this issue in our country has become political, right? And right now, it is very hard to know who is saying what is actually accurate and who is just saying what's in their own interest. And I'm not even talking about one side or the other. You would think on an issue of health that this would not be something that would be politicized. But somehow, our great democracy finds a way to politicize everything now, right? And this is extremely politicized right now. And it's hard to know what is correct and what is not. And you see some states dealing with it in one way, and you see some states dealing with it in another way. And then you see our candidates talking about it in different ways. And it's like, what is true, right? And I think my encouragement to all of us today would be to allow the Lord to define that time to us. To allow God to define that time. Who are you going to let define the time to you? Are you going to let Dr. Fauci define the time to you? Then you'll be ready to go in about 2022. And I'm not just saying that to be, there are some people who that's their, okay, that's, that's true, but if God has a plan for you outside of that, that's in 2021, I would listen to him. I would listen to the Lord on that, right? So um, it's like I said, I don't, I don't um, I'm not saying that to be critical or anything else. I'm saying that to encourage us all, all. Right? No matter which side of the, the partisan aisle you've fallen on during all of the stuff, to encourage us all to let Jesus define that time for us. Right? Because if God has, if God has released you, <laughs> then you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Tori, did you want to share something? Yep. Um... I know that they receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit there in Acts 2 that you referenced about, but back to the John 2019 in, uh, well, sorry, starting in verse 21, it says, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So right there, you see that they received power. They received it in another way. I think building up to that um, that day of Pentecost too, but I feel the need to draw some lines for you guys or to give you pictures and reminders that the enemy comes to kill and steal and destroy. He will come and try to give you anxiety. He's going to come and try to steal your joy, and he's going to try to rob you from peace. Um, he's going to distract you and destroy God's promises to you, so it depends on what you're believing. The flesh can add to that, to what Satan is doing. They come into alignment with each other sometimes if you're going to walk in your flesh and obey Satan at the same time too. But your flesh can rob you and destroy you and do some things also. Um, God has spoken to us peace, 
and Satan wants to steal your peace. And then, um, so we have, of course, the blood of Jesus Christ he gave us to overcome, and we have truth. And a couple weeks ago, Pastor Chris spoke on uh, when him and Pilate were, Jesus and Pilate were talking, and he said, what is truth? And that's also the world's question, what is truth? Um, but he also gave us the whole armor of God. And with each piece that you put on is truth. There's truth behind it. So you have the word, you have the blood of Jesus Christ, you have truth. So um, every piece that you put on speaks truth. And then in Romans 14, 17, if you have your Bible, you can turn there. I'm just going to read it real quick, though. It says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Which then made me think of the Lord's prayer when he said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus said to the disciples in that room, As the Father sent me, so I send you. What was Jesus sent here for? Same as Jesus was here to reconcile us to God, we are now his hands and his feet, the church. So he sends us by the power of the Spirit. He breathed on them, and just as in Genesis, um, God breathed into Adam. Now the second Adam, you can see here what they call Jesus. Sometimes they refer to him as the second Adam. He breathes on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. And he gives life to the disciples and power to write the New Testament for us. So I'm going back to the word. We have to know the Bible, Old Testament and New. But gave them the power to write the New Testament and to live in those tumultuous times where they had to get out there. They had to live in it. And now God is still speaking that to us today. So um, I mentioned that uh, what is making this a difficult situation for people is that um, somehow or another this has morphed into like a political issue right now. But um, at the same time, I don't want to say that in a critical way of our leaders, okay? Um, if you want to hear me be critical of leaders, talk to me after service. No, I'm just kidding. But honestly, <laughs> it's just a joke, sort of. So, but honestly, though, the point isn't really an issue with our leaders. You know, I was having, um, I was having breakfast with some pastors this last week, and, and all of us are still just wrestling through these issues on what to do, how to lead our church. And I said to them at the time, I feel for every person who has been in leadership in any realm, whether it's management in a company or any place where you've been, or even over your own home, any place where you've had to be in a spot to make decisions during this process is difficult because it feels like no matter what you do right now, you're putting somebody's life at risk, right? Oh, I'll, I'll open the church up. Well, you're risking, you know, COVID. Okay, well, I'll keep the church outside. Well, a tree's going to fall on their head, right? Seriously, these are all things that I think about, things that I hear all the time. I put the church outside. People are getting pelted with acorns nonstop. It's like, oh, my goodness, I'm so sorry, right? It's like, how do you even, you know, and it's just this constant kind of grind. I almost brought it to share with you, but um, my buddy Eric from over at Valley Christian, he sent me this picture of like a before and after. It's like, your pastor at the beginning of COVID, and it was a picture of Tom Hanks as Mr. Rogers, right? And they said, your pastor at the end of COVID, and it was Tom Hanks in Castaway, right? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I totally get it, right? But I think, um, I think part of the reason that it's the issue has gotten political and part of the reason that leaders have struggled with this, maybe even more so than they should have, is because they've owned too much of the responsibility for it. And what I mean by that is that 
people are adults. <laughs> you know, there's none of us in this room who have not had a seven or eight month diet steadily of COVID information by this point. And it's like, if you haven't formed your own opinion and strategy about what to do by now, I don't know, right? <laughs> it's like, so, you know, come or don't, right? That's at this point, I feel like it, I feel like that would be a better route in our nation as well, is to just trust Americans to stay well and to do what they need to do for their own health concerns. But the point is, is that too many people have begun to take ownership of an issue that really needs to be between you and the Lord. And another reason why it needs to be between you and God and not something that Pastor Chris said or not something that Governor Newsom said or not something that Donald Trump said, it needs to be between you and God is because just because you step back out into life, even if you go for life completely normal, right? Even if the Lord leads you back into it, that is not a guarantee that it's going to be free from hardship. It's not. So it's like if you, if you say, oh, well, Pastor Chris, you know, told me I should be back in church or something, and then you end up getting COVID, it's like, well, you know, if God told you to do that and you get COVID, fine, right? But it's not, you can't, you can't leave that up to other people. It needs to be an issue between you and God. Now, if God leads you to do it, what I can give you an assurance of is that nothing is going to take you before the Lord is ready, right? God is in control. Now, we look at a disciple like in this case, like Peter. And Peter was led by the Holy Spirit to do exactly what he did and to stand up to those people exactly when he did the very thing he was afraid of, right? He stood up to it right when God told him to do it. Does that mean he was free from trouble? No, he got beat for it. Right? But it's interesting that when it happened and it was, it was God's leading, that he walked down the road afterwards rejoicing that he was counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. See, it's not a guarantee that life is going to be free from hardship or that. No. But what it is, is it's a guarantee that you are still in the will and the hands and the protection, the provision of God Almighty. Jesus had already told Peter at some point, you will lay down your life for me. In fact, he told him the manner in which he would die. He told Peter before, before Jesus ascended back into heaven, he told Peter that he was going to have his hands stretched out, that he was going to be crucified. But what we forget about that is that Peter was nearly 70 years old before that happened, right? It was still in God's timing, in God's economy, right? So it's not a guarantee that you'll be free from hardship, but it is a guarantee that God is still in control of your life. So I believe it's time for the church, for Christians to be praying about this. God, what would you have me do next? Lord, are you ready for me to come back to church? God, is this the time when I should be stepping out and going back into the world? Is this the time when I should be getting back into life? Or, you know, what is God leading you to do? God has it. Um, don't let the other things determine your time frame. I would encourage you not to do that because I don't know that we can necessarily trust all of these different sources as well, right? It really is an issue that should be between, be between us and the Lord. They keep, they keep putting out these finish lines for us that are going to be ever moving. And that's why I say, allow it to be between you and the Lord. I hear right now, you know, they say, oh, we'll have a vaccine in no time flat. 
Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But I can tell you this, vaccines will not be the end of this thing. It's just a whole new battle for the millions and millions of people who will not take a vaccine. Right? So that's why I'm saying just we're not going to be able to let the world define this for us. I'm not encouraging you to like so rebel or whatever. It's nothing like that. I'm saying seek the Lord on this issue. Seek God. I, I don't want to stay locked away for one more moment than the Lord would have me do that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Tori, anything before we... Um, a reminder of just being tethered to the word and that anchor in the yes. word or I've told my kids it's like a compass like this is what's going to get you through is the compass and um, that's the word of God and you're not going to yes. every answer that you need is in the Bible Amen. you pray about it and God will give you that peace that it's talking about when he says peace I give you you're not going to make a bad decision if you have the peace of God so Amen. Amen. Yep. Well, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, God, for just your providence, your timing, God, that you brought us back to this chapter on our first Sunday back in our building, Lord. And even that is just confirmation to me, God, that your hand is on us, that, Lord, we have been hearing your voice correctly, that we are walking in the timing that you have for us as a church. And I pray, Lord, whatever decision, whatever Whatever place you lead each and every member of our church to, Lord, that, God, they would have that peace about it that you spoke into the disciples. That, Lord, whether people still feel like for whatever reason in their life, that, God, you were leading them to stay where they're at, that, God, you would speak to them in that place, then peace be with you. That even now, Lord, you would breathe your Holy Spirit upon them. And if there are others, Lord, that in different ways, different stages have said, no, I need to go again. God is telling me to go again. I'm feeling sent again back into the world. That, Lord, you would speak to them and say, peace. Peace to them, Lord, in their decisions. Confidence, Lord, that you are going to protect them and care for them, God. Bring confidence and peace, Lord, to those who so desperately need it today, Lord. God, there is nothing you can't do. We serve the almighty God. And Lord, whatever you lead us to, you're going to get it done, Lord. You're going to protect us. You have our times appointed, God. Even you have our days numbered, Lord. So we commit all of that to you, Jesus. We put all our hope in you. In your glorious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Love you guys. Love all of you online. And um, see you soon.